Okay, Jeff. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. This session is um, Varieties of Transcendentalism. It's session 1B on Saturday, July 10th, 2021. I'm Jeff Wisner. I'm a board member of the Thoreau Society and editor of Thoreau's Animals and Thoreau's Wildflowers. Uh, I'll be moderating the panel and we'll have three presentations today. Our first presentation will be Transcendentalism in Today's World by Paul Christopher. Next is Transcendentalist Interrupted, Martha Hunt and Henry David Thoreau by Randall Fuller. And finally, Social Diversity in Thoreau's Dissentient Politics by Albana Bakracheva. Just reminders, if you have questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A button under your screen. Uh, speakers, I'll alert you in the chat function uh, when you have five minutes left. Now to um, introduce today's speakers. Paul Christopher earned a PhD in philosophy from the University of Massachusetts. For many years, he was head of the philosophy department at the United States Military Academy at West Point. His publications include The Ethics of War and Peace, an introduction to moral and legal issues. For several years, he taught a summer course where 12 to 14 students would spend a week in the classroom discussing works by Thoreau, then a week in the White Mountains and a week canoeing on the Saco River in Maine, which sounds amazing. Uh, Randall Fuller, is the Herman Melville Distinguished Professor of American Literature at the University of Kansas and the author of th three books, most recently, The Book That Changed America, How Darwin's Evolutionary Theory Ignited a Nation. He is at work on the first book-length feminist history of American transcendentalism, which examines women, intellectuals, and artists from 1800 to 1860. Finally, Albena Bakracheva, is Professor of American Literature at New Bulgarian University in Sofia, Bulgaria. She has written various books and essays on 19th century American literature and has translated works by Thoreau and Emerson into Bulgarian. She's a founding member of the International American Studies Association. And in 2014, she received the Thoreau Society's Walter Harding Distinguished Service Award. So thank you all for being here uh, and thank you attendees for, for being here. Uh, Paul, would you start us off? Thank you. Uh, first, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited about Thoreau, and I'm excited to be able to talk about him. I think that Walden is probably the single greatest example of what transcendentalism is uh, in any, any publication anywhere. And um, I think it might even be called the Transcendental Handbook. So I want to talk about Henry David's views on what exactly transcendentalism is, but I'll uh, proceed that by talking about, a little bit about what a definition might be for transcendentalism, especially as it you know, was understood uh, at, at that time. You know, the, the term comes from Immanuel Kant and the critique of pure reason. And he uses it, and I'm only gonna say this for 10 seconds because I don't wanna talk about Immanuel Kant, but he develops it as a foundation for synthetic a priori judgments. And what he's trying to do is say that there are, um, we can make necessary judgments, metaphysical judgments without having experience. And because in our constitution as human beings, we have notions of a uh, space and time, which are inherent. And therefore we can use that to uh, make judgments about the world without having any experience. They're just metaphysical uh, judgments. So you invent transcendentalism. Uh, it doesn't really correlate to what Ralph Waldo Emerson is gonna say about transcendentalism. And it doesn't seem that relevant to what Thoreau says. So when we start saying, well, what, what, where can we come up with a definition for what transcendentalism is besides out of Walden? Well, we might look to Dial. The Dial was the transcendental journal for four years. Um, uh, quarterly journal, and Thoreau wrote about 30 articles for it. Uh, it doesn't, and there's one article in there, uh, an editorial by um, Ralph Waldo called Transcendentalism. But when you read it, it's about trying to reconcile the differences between Quakers and Calvinists. It doesn't really help us. I don't think the dial has anything significant to say about what transcendental, transcendentalism really is. So we can go look at uh, an essay, actually a lecture, 
by Ralph Waldo Emerson, which he gave to, um, which he gave in, I think it was, here it is, January 1842 at the Masonic Temple in Boston. The name of the lecture was The Transcendentalist. And I'll just uh, read one paragraph in the beginning for what he says. Uh, what is popularly called transcendentalism is idealism. Idealism as it appears in 1842. As thinkers, mankind has ever divided into two sects, materialists and idealists. The first class founding on experience, the second on consciousness. The first class beginning to think from the data of the senses, the second class to perceive that the senses are not final and say the senses give us representations of things, but what are the things themselves, they cannot tell. I don't know if I uh, actually understand what uh, Ralph Waldo uh, is up to, but it doesn't seem to help us for a definition. He goes on, he talks about Kant and, and how Kant uh, came up with the term. So that doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem to me we, we find any really working definition of transcendentalism any better than what we get in Thoreau's examples. We know that Thoreau was a transcendentalist and, and he refers to himself as that. And uh, in his journal entry in February in 1855, he says, many complain of my lectures, lectures that they are transcendental can't understand them. And, and there's a passage in uh, Joseph Crutcher's biography, uh, I think in 1948, he wrote, wrote 1948, where he reports that uh, from the journal, May 1843, th that um, armed with a letter of introduction from Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau had a three hour meeting with Henry James the Elder in New York City, the purpose of which was to explain transcendentalism. Of course, we don't have any notes from that meeting. I wish we did. And then, uh, in another biography, Henry Canby, in his 1939 biography, quotes a journal entry where Thoreau describes himself as a mystic, a transcendentalist, and a natural philosopher to boot. And then there's other passages from him. So we know he was a transcendentalist, but he, the, the word doesn't come up in much in Thoreau's writing. We don't find it in Walden. We don't find it in Civil Gifts Media. We don't find it with Life Without Principle. We don't find it in Wild Apples. We don't find it in, I don't find it anything except a few references in his journal. So it's a tough concept to define. We can't, we have to remember Aristotle's famous line where he said, we shouldn't look for the same uh, precision in human affairs that we do, we find and can get in mathematics. And transcendentalism is one of those things that doesn't lend itself well to a conceptual theory. You can't say a person is a transcendentalist if and only if and you line them out. Uh, uh, that doesn't work that way. So we can't really define it. Uh, Plato has the same problem with some of his operatic dialogues. But, he, but what Thoreau does do is he gives us incredibly brilliant examples of transcendentalism. And, and he never refers to him as that. But once we figure out what's going on, it's easy to pick them out. And I want to do just a couple of them today. Um, well, first, let's say uh, in following Plato's method, where Plato, when he, Plato tackles things like uh, what is courage, what is knowledge, what is piety, what is virtue, he begins, a lot of the times it's what it is not. So he can't really define it in a conceptual theory, but he can say what it is not, and then give us examples of it. And that's exactly what Henry David does. In his opening chapter, he just, he tells you what transcendentalism is not. And I can't believe that the people in, in uh, Concord didn't tire and feather him after they read that, what he wrote, because it was just, it's just brutal. He eviscerates everybody. I mean, you can't read it without laughing. And that's one of the appeals that young kids, I think college kids find because he takes the, uh, <laughs> the status quo and he just tears it apart. Well, that's an example. The people that he's talking about are not transcendentalists and they have no, no concept of it. But he, then he turns from, he changes that and he's gonna give his examples of it. And I'm gonna read a couple of them right now. Um, I just love this little passage. It's from the bean field. As I drew a still fresher soil about the rose with my hoe, I disturbed the ashes of unchronicled nations who in primeval years lived under these heavens and their small implements of war and hunting were brought to the light of modern day. They lay mingled with other natural stones, some of which bore the marks of having been burned by Indian fires and some by the sun and also bits of pot pottery and glass brought hither by the recent cultivators of the soil. When my hoe tingled against the stones, the music echoed to the woods and sky. When, when he talks about music, he is generally, that's a pre, he's gonna talk about something transcendental after, 
He always proceeds his transcendental discussions with a mention of music. And once you pick that up as you're reading through the road, also he's talking about the uh, the alien harps, the, the Zephyr wind. He's going to go transcendental on us, or and then something he tries to. Sometimes he doesn't make it, and he admits that. But we'll get back to that as I continue. When my hoe tingled against the stones, the music echoed in the woods and the sky, and was an accompaniment to my labor, which yielded an instant and immeasurable crop. Now, what was the crop? He's hoeing. He's he, he, the beans. <laughs> what is the crop? The crop was this. It was no longer beans that I hoed or I that hoed beans. So he has made the transition from an individual existence to a metaphysical existence. He's escaped the linear time and uh, physical space to become, it, well, who was? It was the universal bean hoer or gardener or hoer. He goes from an individual experience. He transcends the individual, actual, physical, linear time experience to a transcendental experience. And it's just brilliant. And he does this again and again and again throughout Walden. And, you know, we've got to be careful, though, because if we're sleeping like the, the uh, Irish immigrants as railroad tie, he can run right over us. We don't get it. <laughs> you got to stay attuned to it. Here's another example. I think it's just fun. I heard a robin in the distance, the first I had heard for many a thousand years. Wait a minute. Uh, we live in a linear time. So as soon as he says the first that I heard for many a thousand years, we know where he's going. He gives us the clue. You gotta be paying attention to his little clues because so he, it's not about Robbins. First that I heard for many a thousand years, we thought, whose note I shall not forget for many a thousand more. Well, obviously he's not gonna be alive for a thousand years. So what must he be talking about? He's talking about the metaphysical him, the human beings, uh, the same sweet, powerful song as of yore. Oh, the evening Robin at the end of a New England summer day, if I could find the twig he sits on, I mean he, I mean the twig. This at least is not the Turtus migratorius, which is the scientific Latin name for Robin. It was the universal Robin. It was as he transcends his present insignificant, meager, narrow existence to a higher level, the universal twig and the Robin sitting on it, to borrow platonic, uh, platonic terms, it's the form of the perch with the Robin singing, not the spatio-temporal instance of a single existence. Isn't that beautiful? All right. Um, an, another, how am I doing on time? Another uh, HDT's perspective on transcendentalism has to do with his relationship to nature. Um, one of his objectives in his sojourn at Walden was to transition from being an observer of nature, an outside looking at nature, to becoming part of it, to becoming in nature. And Thoreau, we know he's, he, you know, the little cabin, the chrysalis, he goes in, he spends his time, and he comes out in the spring, and he has made that transition. And here's how he tells us about it. Not with a definition, not with using the term transcendental, but with an example. And, and remember, in the, when he first moves into the house, housewarming chapter, he has a passage about geese wild migratory geese, the whistling of the wings, and they're afraid of them. And when he comes back, they, he, they flush and fly away at, at, at night even. But when he comes out in the spring, he again experiences the geese. Listen, to this. as it grew darker, I was startled by the honking of geese flying low over the woods, like weary travelers getting it late from southern lakes and indulging at last in unrestrained complaint and mutual consolation. Standing at my door, I could hear the rush of their wings, just like he did in the house one, the rush of their wings. When driving toward my house, they suddenly spied my light and with hushed clamor, wheeled and settled in the pond. Because they were no longer, he was no longer an outsider like he was there in house one. He had transitioned from being an outsider to the, being welcome. The, the wild geese coming from Canada accepts him in his cabin, sees his light, and actually comes in and lands in front of it. What a beautiful way to describe his acceptance into nature. <laughs> I, don't, I can't, he, and he never says it. He says afterward, so I came in and shut the door and passed my first spring night in the woods. <laughs> and that doesn't extend chills up your spine. It's just as beautiful an example as I can find anywhere. Um, but he also talks about his failures and they're just as much fun. You know, when I, when I read Thoreau, we don't want to read him as he, as people, as an observer, we want to 
be in his shoes. We want to feel what he feels. We want to understand what he understands, what he sees, what he smells, what he touches, how he views the Robinson. And that's the ethereal experience, to be sure. So let's talk about a failure, because I think it's one of the great passages in all of Walden. The loon. <laughs> I mean, when I just mentioned the loon, everybody smiles. <laughs> it's just such a great, great example of Henry David Thoreau in his boat, rowing around Walden, trying to get close to the loon. He can't. And the loon represents wildness. And he is, he chases it. Going, and the, it's a long passage. I can't read it here because I don't have enough time. But if you have nothing to do, and I go back and read that. If you can read that loon passage without laughing, and smiling, well, you're nobody I want to have a beer with. <laughs> it is such a beautiful, beautiful passage. And uh, and then at the end, you know, he he comes up, he, he, the loon gods appear and he brings his boat in. And goes, he doesn't succeed in getting close to the loon. He misses it. <laughs> but he tells us about that. And, and there are other uh, things as well. Um, if I could, uh, well, I do have one more example that, I, that everybody's familiar with that I'd like to do if I have. Do I have five minutes left? No? Oh, you, you're, you're muted, George. Yes. Sorry, um, you've got three minutes left. Yeah, three minutes. Uh, let's see. So what should I do in three minutes? Um, <clears throat> there's a passage in uh, Aristotle that says, it, it was a personal identity question. Who are you? Well, Aristotle says that you are what you think. That the, in this physical world, our bodies are always changing. We're getting older and sicker and everything. We forget things. But at any given time, what you think in your head is who you are. So if we can share what Thoreau thinks, we can theoretically feel what he's feeling and understand what he's understanding. And that's the challenge of reading and reading Henry David is to uh, get outside of our own view of the world and get inside Henry and Walden Pond and feel what he feels and somehow share that ethereal transcendental experience. We go from being an individual to being a metaphysical or universal entity. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much. I, um, I appreciate that you, uh, you see and enjoy the humor in Thoreau, which uh, a lot of people don't. And that was, I think, my way into appreciating uh, Walden and, uh, and becoming a Thoreauvian. Yeah, thank you. Don't you find that first chapter economy just hilarious? <laughs> I know this is E.B. White, where he talks about Thoreau riding into tiny, uh, town on his horse with a six gun, shooting up in the air, <laughs> unsettling everything. And, and, uh, yes. and, and that's exactly what Thoreau does in economy. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the humor, if you don't get the humor, you need yeah. to do something else. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. And, uh, and next up is uh, Randy Fuller. Uh, would you take it away? Thank you, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody in virtual Thoreau land. Um, although not everyone will recognize her name, most of us will recall the story of Martha Hunt, or rather the last chapter of her story. On the evening of July 9th, 1845, Nathaniel Hawthorne answered a knock at the door of the old man of the old manse and learned that a young woman had drowned herself in the Concord River a few hundred yards away. Later in his journal, he described a harrowing search by moonlight in the boat he had purchased from Thoreau, as well as the ultimate grisly recovery of Hunt's body. Hawthorne's description of the corpse would be repurposed and transfigured seven years later in the Blythdale romance where Hunt's death by suicide and Margaret Fuller's drowning off the coast of Fire Island are fused to create the tragedy of, quote, a high-spirited woman bruising herself against the narrow limitations of her sex. Today, I'd like to present several of the earlier chapters of Hunt's life, and then to juxtapose them with that other notable event of July 1845, Thoreau's removal to the banks of Walden Pond. Doing so, I think, will highlight some of the ways in which a person's class position and upbringing could exclude them from full participation in transcendentalist culture. And this may in turn point to some gaps in our understanding of that culture. Martha Hunt was born in 1826 in a plain, unpainted house on Punkatasset Hill, a mile or so outside of Concord. Her family struggled to extract a subsistence from their farm's stingy soil. 
their difficulties compounded by the fact that of 10 children, seven were daughters. With more sons, the Hunt family might have cultivated more soil, might have produced more goods, and in the process generated more cash with which to buy more land, but this wasn't the case. With nearly a dozen mouths to feed and few hands to till the soil, the Hunts resembled those hereditary yeomen that Thoreau describes um, whose misfortune quoted is to have inherited farms, houses, barns, cattle, and farming tools, and who begin digging their graves as soon as they are born, end quote. Despite these straightened circumstances, Martha Hunt, the oldest child in the family, quickly impressed her teachers with her intellectual precociousness, and when she was 15, she began attending nearby Groton Academy. According to George William Curtis, who briefly lived next to the family, she was, quote, a delicate girl, a girl of delicate and shy temperament who excelled so much in study that she was sent to a fine academy in a neighboring town. There she encountered refinement and cultivation, a social gaiety and grace, which were entirely unknown in the hard life she had known at home and which harmonized with her nature and her dreams, end quote. And Moncure Daniel Conway, who boarded with the Hunts during one of his sporadic visits to Concord, learned from Martha's sisters that she, quote, had interested George Bradford, Emerson, and other scholars by her serious studies and her high aims, end quote. She was the beneficiary of a recent expansion of educational opportunities for women. Part of a trend in the early years of the 19th century, whereby women increasingly received formal instruction in literature and history in the expectation that they would then educate their sons and daughters. She was also the recipient of Concord's best known export, Transcendentalist Philosophy. By all accounts, Martha Hunt stood on the outskirts of an emergent transcendentalism, peering from the margins with famished gaze, impressing its members, aspiring to join their numbers. According to one Concord resident, Annie Sawyer Downs, the young woman, quote, became interested in Margaret Fuller, the Channings, and Emerson, and while they in turn lent her books and endeavored to brighten her somewhat monotonous life. Conway similarly reports that Martha, quote, had been much agitated by the new transcendentalist ideas and ideals that filled the air. We do not know exactly which work she read by Emerson and Fuller, but it seems likely she absorbed Fuller's arguments on behalf of women's equality and freedom, which were published uh, in uh, Women in the 19th Century just earlier that year. And also Emerson's insistence that nature was the locus of intense spiritual awakening. Yet if she hoped that attending Groton Academy would usher her into a higher life, she was sadly mistaken. Upon graduation, she returned to the family home and found that she was now expected to contribute to its income. Unlike many farmers' daughters who made their way to the textile factories in Waldham and uh, Lowell, Martha pursued the only other career available to a young woman with her training, quote, doling out ABC, as Curtis puts it, to a wild group of boys and girls. In other words, she became the teacher at the schoolhouse in Concord's District 4, located a mile west of the town center where she instructed 60 students for an annual salary of $38.50. Her disappointment in this development is expressed in the only piece of her writing to have survived, which turns out to be excerpts from a journal that were published in her obituary. That journal, apparently kept in the back pages of an Italian primer, may be understood as the work of an outsider artist whose status on the fringes of New England transcendentalism indicates some of the movement's limitations. Martha's writings sometimes reveal her efforts to conform to ideals of acceptable womanhood, but those efforts are just as often undermined by resistance. She will sometimes express a pietistic submission to fate, quote, oh, father, Thou art incomprehensibly great and perfect, and I, a mere atom of the dust. Oh, how the thought of thee fills my soul. But these expressions are leavened by a Dickinsonian rage at a deity who often seems aloof and punitive. 
Oh my God, she writes, art thou indeed my father who doth desert me? Oh, what have I done? Martha anticipates other writers too, as in a remarkable passage that prefigures Ishmael's famous question in Moby Dick. And this is Martha in her journal. We cry loudly for the poor oppressed slave, but slaves are not confined to color. Slaves are we not all slaves. Often she invokes the vocabulary of transcendental individualism to combat her despair. Exult, O soul, in thy trials, she writes. They are the steps that lead to life. Yet, as we know, Emersonian self-reliance was notoriously unavailable to women of the period, and Martha sometimes reveals the way in which the desire for agency may turn against itself when one is a woman. Am I indeed so selfish that I think only of self, she asks. And in another entry, she admits, selfishness is the thorn that pierceth so. It is tempting to pathologize here, to minimize through diagnosis. Quote, she was of a melancholic temperament, Hawthorne reports in his notebook. And this opinion was repeated as well by the author of her obituary. But it should be pointed out that Martha's melancholy had a specific cultural context too, one that was linked to the effective structure of transcendentalism. At times, the land smells with suicide, Emerson announced. Young men have no hope. The educated class stand idle in the streets. And elsewhere in the American scholar, he describes promising young people who, quote, turn drudges or die of disgust, some of them suicides. Feelings of hopelessness, then, of life thwarted, were and still can be the obverse of transcendental optimism. And Martha Hunt is certainly not the only person in Concord circa 1845 to despair. In early May, at almost exactly the same moment, she portrays herself as a mere atom of dust, a disillusioned Henry David Thoreau raised the frame of his cabin on Walden Pond, quote, with the help of some acquaintances, rather to improve so good an occasion for neighbor neighborliness than from any necessity, end quote. This is the way Thoreau described his experiment years after the fact, but in truth, at the time, he longed to escape pencil making and farming, his family's occupations, and he'd already endured a fairly miserable tenure as a school teacher. In 1845, his plan was to move to Walden, to become a writer, and to finish his first book. The difference between him and Martha Hunt, of course, was that he was a man, which meant that he was able to believe that history and society were prisons from which he could escape. And this belief in turn allowed him to dream of living alone in a small cabin with a plastered fireplace and planked floor where he might remake himself through language and be born anew. And I'm thinking, of course, of the passage every morning I got up early and bathed in the pond. That was a religious exercise and one of the best things I did. Yet his journal from the period is sometimes similar to Martha's, capturing the winsome voice of an unhappy young person at loose ends. While the 4th of July is celebrated in town with speeches and fireworks, Thoreau sits amid the pines and woodchucks and he writes, if I'm not quite right here, I am less wrong than before. Martha Hunt feels that she is anything but quite right. Pierced with a private anguish, she writes during this last week of her life, quote, heaven knows the leaden weights that press down the bursting soul, end quote. Possibly around this time, she makes her first attempts to take her life, for according to Hawthorne, she had been seen walking up to her chin into the water, but coming out again in compassion to the agony of a sister who stood on the bank. On the 4th of July, Thoreau moves to the shores of Walden um, and writes, I wish to meet the facts of life, the vital facts, which are the phenomena or actuality the gods meant to show us. The next day on July 5th, Martha writes in the pages of her Italian primer, our nature is oppressed to its last power of endurance. These heavy chains are the links in the trial that is to purify us for new freedom. And that evening, longing for a new freedom of his own, Thoreau opens his notebook and begins to write 
I am glad to remember tonight as I sit by my door that I am at least a remote descendant of that heroic race of men of whom there is a tradition. I too sit here on the shore of my Ithaca, a fellow wanderer and survivor of Ulysses. Several days later on July 8th, Martha enters a final note in her journal and it's an unfinished sentence, quote, let me but rest myself in God and, end quote. The conquered freeman will blame Martha Hunt's death upon febrile mental activity unbecoming in a woman. Miss Hunt was a very accomplished young lady, it writes, and it is supposed she committed the act in a momentary fit of insanity brought on by intense study. Martha's self-diagnosis scrawled in her journal is a sort of pre of this verdict. She writes, my animal wants are all supplied. Oh, who shall supply the wants of my mind? In the Blackdale romance, Miles Coverdale will speculate on the thought processes that prompted Zenobia to drown herself. She had seen pictures, I suppose, of drowned, of drowned persons in lithe and graceful attitudes, and she deemed it well and decorous to die as so many village maidens have, wronged in their first love and seeking peace in the bosom of the old familiar stream. But what Coverdale fails to understand is how such a young woman, how, how such young women, newly educated in an age of reform, nevertheless remained powerless to enter the public realm, and so felt themselves divested of any future that did not include marriage or, if one was especially lucky, independent wealth. In his notebook, Hawthorne notes that Martha, quote, died for want of sympathy a severe penalty for having cultivated and refined herself out of the sphere of her natural connections. Yet this observation fails to recognize, it seems to me, how the same cultural forces that gave rise to transcendentalism, its optimism, its affirmation, its inspiration to susceptible souls, could also damage young women who were without the means to cultivate or sustain these qualities. Annie Sawyer Down suggests as much in her recollections. I have been told, she wrote, that Martha Hunt's death cast a shadow upon the conquered philosophy which time alone dispelled. It was said, despairing of reconciling its fascinating ideals with the somber realities of life, that she sought in suicide relief from struggle. And Conway refers to the huge chasm between aspiration and reality when he notes that there were no other tragedies of the kind as surprising. Many whose story has found no chronicler must have been brought into sad discord with their environment. People in the village later reported that Martha stood by the river's edge for at least two hours. She paced, she stared into the sluggish brown water of the Concord River hypnotized by its shallows and its depths. At some point when no one was looking, she removed her bonnet and shoes and handkerchief and placed them neatly on a dry spot beneath a huge oak tree. The meadows surrounding the river were open and wide and nearby a steady morning traffic of drovers and school children and farmers went on their way to town to sell butter and milk and eggs. Around seven, when there was a pause in this traffic, she stepped into the river's sluggish current. She entered a footnote into history. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, makes me look forward to your, your feminist history of transcendentalism. There's a lot to, to uncover. Um, so our last speaker, uh, Albina Bakracheva, uh, speaking on social diversity in Thora's dissentient politics. Um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Let me begin by, by saying <clears throat> that I chose my focus for two major reasons. One, that coming from Eastern Europe, I'm deeply interested in the events of 1968. 
whose 50th anniversary was largely celebrated, rather commemorated three years ago, uh, with Thoreau's major political idea especially highlighted. And my second reason is that this year is the 80th anniversary of our Thoreau Society, and I'd like to pay tribute to its founder, Walter Harding, whom I worked with as a young Fulbrighter many years ago. So here it goes. <clears throat> Thinking of John Brown, whom he strongly supported in the last years of his life, Henry Thoreau noted that the art of composition is as simple as the discharge of a bullet from a rifle and its masterpieces imply an infinitely greater force behind them." Unquote. Thoreau was discussing the truthfulness of man in relation to his speech, not the effect of man's words. But if speaking the truth was the issue, this first, this second, this third, then it follows only naturally that such masterpieces of composition may imply an indefinite and an infinitely greater force not only behind them, but also resulting from them, evoked by them in future circumstances. Circumstances initially unpredictable and diverse. Thoreau shot his bullet in Concord Lyceum in the winter of 1848 by delivering a speech later to be known as civil disobedience. His target was very near then, namely his fellow Concordians, but as always with Thoreau, it was universal too. Now, more than 170 years later, we know sufficiently enough about Thoreau's powerful universal gunshot, which crossed rather diverse borders in the course of the 20th century, reaching India in the 1930s, Denmark in the 40s, Prague and Paris and the United States in the 60s. The 60s were the time when a new interest in Thoreau's work brought in the yet unknown figure of Thoreau, the political thinker and dissenter. Thoreau became not only irrelevant, but almost a popular icon. In these years, civil disobedience was already a phrase used by everyone, from the beats and the hippies to the pacifists and Martin Luther King's civil rights movement. Certainly the Thoreauvian echoes were clear and clearly effective in both the United States and Europe in the 1960s. And so they were in Eastern Europe in the late 80s when civil disobedience became the slogan of all the peaceful revolutions which led to the end of the socialist regime. Eastern Europe rephrased civil disobedience as velvet revolution and subsequently transformed entirely the face of this part of the world. Rather than discuss these more or less well-known and well dealt with echoes of Thoreau's great political idea, I will consider Thoreau's idea itself as revealed by the recent, by recent contextualization of Thoreau's dissent. I will approach Thoreau's nonconformist gesture by relating his concepts of civil disobedience and of wildness, and will argue that this relation provides an additionally nuanced perspective towards the significance of both the gesture of dissent itself and the enormous impact of the essay which explains it. In his 1980, uh, sorry, in his 1968 convocational speech entitled Civilized Disobedience, Walter Harding emphatically declared that, I quote, if 1775 and 1848 are known as the years of revolution, then 1868 will go down as the year of civil disobedience. And here I have this copy of the speech I wanna share with you. Harding clearly states his own position as a speaker, as well as that of his upstate New York academic audience. He will speak as a good citizen addressing his fellow good citizens in order to explain to them 
the essence of the idea of civil disobedience, which he defines as a deliberate violation of a civil law on moral grounds with the willingness to take the consequences of that violation, unquote. In the whole of his speech, Harding provides arguments in favor of Thoreau's idea. But at the same time, he keeps warning his audience that civil disobedience is not and should not be taken as all applicable remedy. Civil disobedience must be civilized if it is to work, Harding is convinced, because he explains civil also means polite and courteous. And Thoreau was thinking of the word just as much in that sense too, unquote. Of the last, however, I don't think we can be certain at all. Not simply because Thoreau's essay was first published as civil disobedience only in 1866, four years after Thoreau's death, and so the title was most likely not even given by Thoreau, but also because in the last years of his life, Thoreau openly supported John Brown and thus vigorously defended actions of violence rather than nonviolent resistance, not to speak of politeness or courteousness. It seems that in the turmoil of 1968, Harding had found himself in the need of moderating or civilizing Thoreau. He would therefore recognize the worldwide glory of Thoreau's civil disobedience gunshot, but would still wish to slow down the bullet. Interestingly enough, in 2016, or almost half a century after Harding's convocational speech, Richard J. Schneider published his study of Thoreau's work under the title, Civilizing Thoreau. Schneider makes rather a different point than Harding's and is interested in what he calls Thoreau's human ecology. Yet both authors in their own way, ways in fact uh, imply that Thoreau and our thinking of Thoreau need some civilizing or let's say taming. Had Henry known about these interpretative impulses, I guess he would have been delighted because what they suggest is very much the recognition of the wild, if not even the too wild Thoreau. All his life Thoreau had believed in and pleaded for wildness, wildness whose glance no civilization can endure. He advocated wildness of thinking and living, of mind and spirit, of nature and society, as life consists with wildness. Such was the wild Thoreau who spent a night in jail in the summer of 1846 and in the winter of 1848 addressed his fellow Concordians with the lecture later to be known as civil disobedience. By 1848, as Laura Walls notes in her outstanding biography of Thoreau, a winter lecture by Henry Thoreau was becoming a regular feature of Concord life, unquote. Thoreau was already a successful and respected lecturer. Moreover, the circumstances of his Walden life had already turned him into a celebrity. By the time Henry Thoreau really um, was, and in the very Winthropian sense indeed, in the eyes of all people. And so he simply had to explain his action. He called his lecture, The Rights and Duties of the Individual in Relation to Government. Unlike Alcott and Charles Lane, <clears throat> Thoreau asks not at once for no government, but at once for a better government. Unlike um, his conquered neighbor, Thoreau advocates even orders active resistance if the injustice is of such a nature that it requires you to be the agent of injustice to another, then I say, break the law. Let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine, unquote. Thoreau had used his own life as counter friction to the machine. Emerson had disapproved. What Thoreau did, Emerson thought 
mean and skulking and in bad taste. Still, disapproval or not, Thoreau had no doubt that he was taken seriously by his conquered audience then, and so provocatively enough, ended his lecture by imagining a truly just state which can afford to be just to all men and to treat the individual with respect as a neighbor. Thoreau's ideal state would not merely accept and protect such dissenting individuals like Alcock and himself, but would actually bear fruit in them, most precious wild fruit. In these final lines of his lecture, Thoreau is clearly ready for the passionate support he will give to the wild rebel John Brown 10 years later. The individual Thoreau celebrates in civil disobedience is a civil dissenter who will not be civilized as this will annihilate him. This individual is wild in the sense of being uniquely non-conformist and extraordinary, a moral corrective in his own right. It is therefore both the right and the duty of such individual to be resistant or act from principle. And action from principle, Thoreau insists, or the perception and the performance of right is what divides states and churches, but not only them. I, it divides the individual. Such is the cathartic effect of action from principle that is that it even divides the indivisible, that is the individual. Thoreau's rhetorical power sets on fire the very etymology of the word, thus making his audience feel the energy he finds in true moral action. It redeems and purifies the government and the state, but also the one who performs it, the individual. So action from principle is above all a duty to oneself, to oneself as man first and subject afterward. In his 1862 eulogy, Emerson set the tradition of interpreting Thoreau's essentially dissentient political mode, cantankerous, um, individualistic, idealistic. However, as Dan Malachuk points out in an excellent essay on Thoreau's politics, recent contextualization reveals two more styles of Thoreau's dissent one profoundly democratic and another bafflingly utopian. Perhaps, Malachuk concludes, Thoreau's third and greatest gift to us is a dissent, as a dissentient is not these familiar counter-democratic deeds of individuality, of democracy, but rather his astounding indifference to democracy itself. Not to confront, but to walk alongside becomes Thoreau's last and most nuanced style of dissent." Unquote. This is already Thoreau the utopian dissenter the saunterer of the Holy Land from the late essay, Walking. In the conclusion of Walden, the book he kept working on until literally his last days, Thoreau writes, I delight to come to my bearings, not walk in procession with pomp and parade in a conspicuous place, but to walk even with the builder of the universe, if I may, not to live in, the, in this restless, nervous, bustling, trivial 19th century, but stand or sit thoughtfully while it goes by. In our own restless, nervous, bustling, trivial 21st century, when Thoreau's adjectives convey meaning even more intensely, we ought to know respect and continue, continually contextualize all the diverse echoes of Thoreau's dissentient politics during the whole course of the previous century, be they in India, 
in the United States, in Czechoslovakia, or everywhere in Eastern Europe in the late 90s, when Thoreau's idea of a peaceful revolution was put into, into practice and successfully ended one of the darkest periods in human history, that of the communist regime. And if the 20th century was mostly listening and responding to Thoreau, the salubrious Democrat and the obstructive individualist, perhaps the new century will be able to hear more distinctly the echoes of the other style of Thoreau's dissent, that of standing or sitting thoughtfully aloof for the sake of preserving one's own inner wildness. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to, um, to all our speakers. I want to encourage everybody, if you haven't um, done so already, to enter your questions uh, using the Q&A button under your screen. Um, first, we have a question for Paul. Um, what do you think of Thoreau's transcendental moments that you quote from Walden as examples of a manifestation of the transparent eyeball that Emerson describes in nature? And uh, go on, he goes on to quote this, the transparent eyeball passage. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part of God, unquote. I love that. Uh... I always enjoy reading Emerson, but afterwards I sit back and say, what did I learn? <laughs> He's really tough. And I, I, I don't know what he means. Well, I kind of can infer what he means about this invisible eyeball, because he's talking the difference between a metaphysical and a, a physical existence, and the eyeball sees the metaphysical existence, and the real eyeball our, doesn't see, we only see the individual existence. But it doesn't seem to help me understand really what transcendentalism is. Thoreau, on the other hand, I think he's brilliant. When you read Thoreau and, and pay attention to what he's saying, you can't not understand what transcendentalism is. He makes it so clear to us. Ralph Waldo, on the other hand, as much fun as he is to read, I never feel like I walk away enlightened. So I don't have anything to say about that passage. Thanks for the question, though. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, I want to invite uh, the other speakers to unmute yourselves. And if you feel like chipping in on a question, uh, feel free or posing a question to, to one another. Uh, we have another question from Tammy Rose who asks, um, this would be a question for Randy. Um, in terms of Martha Hunt, I believe her sisters slash cousins also committed suicide in the river. Was there actually a backlash against transcendentalism in particular or was the blame put more upon women trying to become intellectuals with the other members of her family trying to get an education too. Yeah, that, that's, um, those, that's a great question and a great point to raise. Um, so, so Martha Hunt is the oldest of six surviving sisters. And one of the younger sisters, 15 years later, also drowns herself in the Concord River. And I should say, she does so the day after she goes and talks to Thoreau, um, according to um, his friend Ellery Channing, um, who's not entirely always the, um, <laughs> the most uh, factual of, of uh, biographers. But um, so, so there is clearly, um, you know, there there's, seems to be clearly a, a possible genetic um, or inherited depressive disorder in the family. Um, but having said that, um, there, the younger sister uh, who drowned herself also uh, was a school teacher and and you, one can go online and and read the um, reports of the Concord Educational Committee both before and when Al uh, Bronson Alcott was in charge of it and and learn that the conditions for teaching uh, young children in Concord at the at the time were were fairly onerous I mean apparently they were tiny tiny classrooms unventilated with 60 kids in all grades 
And you have like a 19 year old young woman trying to handle that and be an intellectual at the same time. Um, all of the daughters uh, went to the Groton Academy. And one of the great mysteries to me is how the family afforded uh, that, how they made that happen, whether there were, whether there was local um, uh, donations to help the, the Hunt daughters go to the Groton Academy. Um, it's, I just, I can't find the answer to that. Um, so I think that answers two of the questions. And then maybe the, the main question is, what, was there a transcendental backlash or was there um, more of a backlash toward uh, women who were pursuing um, intellectual activity? I guess what I guess the point that that I want to make about that would just simply be that um, the whole premise and promise of transcendentalism is its availability to the self, you know, the, the availability for anyone to be able to experience um, the sorts of um, things that we're talking about vis-a-vis -vis Thoreau and, and Emerson. Um, and and what, I, what I wanted to show is how uh, that experience could be thwarted or constrained by, by circumstances in ways that we still don't always I think think about um, when we think about transcendentalism. I'm as far as whether there was a a, a backlash. A, the Concord Freeman um, uh, obituary, uh, which was almost certainly written by Reverend Barzillai Frost, um, the the minister who Emerson famously says he'd rather be outside in the snow than sitting in the pews uh, listening to. Um, it seems to say a that Martha was depressive and two that she studied too much and that she she wanted uh, as Hawthorne says to rise above a sphere that was that was really where she was destined to be. Um, what I have been really interested in is to try to find um, a response by Emerson or Bronson Alcott or or Thoreau or anybody who who knew her to this tragedy. And the record there is mute. And, and to me, that maybe says something um, on its own, so. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question myself for Albana. I wonder if you could say a little more about the connections between Thoreau and civil disobedience and the, uh, the Velvet Revolutions, because this may not be as familiar to a lot of people as, as we'd like to think. Yeah, thank you so much for this question, Joe. Um, well, um, this idea was in many ways the trigger um, of all the Velvet Revolutions, the peaceful revolutions all over Eastern Europe. With certain um, um, exclusions, this was the overall situation. They were all of them peaceful, that is bloodless. And the slogan was this, civil disobedience. In those years, it was not necessarily related to Thoreau. It was mostly related to Gandhi. But I have to say something very personal here. It was exactly in those years of the political change when I translated Thoreau's civil disobedience. So uh, the name and the idea got connected in the due context. So I'm really happy to have had the chance to do that. So anyway, it worked. It worked, worked all over Eastern Europe. And um, although times are very complicated and this is not a new something to say. And the way I ended my presentation uh, speaks for itself. But uh, thinking back about those years, the enthusiasm that something is possible finally the Berlin Wall falling down, all, you know, um, this, this uh, joyfulness that finally something is happening, although it seemed it was never going to happen. The reality under the regime was just frozen. Uh, it didn't move at all. So, you know, this idea, Thoreau's idea, gave the name of the whole process that really changed the face of this um, 
of this part of the world. It's good to be thinking back about those years and the enthusiasm, but I'm now back to the way I ended my, my paper with. Thoreau, the utopian dissenter, standing thoughtfully aloof, that's probably um, somewhat of a mature stance um, in one's um, existence. But let me say something else. I was extremely glad to listen to Paul's um, joyful way of speaking on Thoreau, of enjoying Thoreau's joy, because we're usually very serious when we speak of Thoreau, and he had such a tremendous sense of humor. And in these last years, I have to tell you, I've been working a lot on Cape Cod. I've written a lot on Cape Cod, and now I'm in the process of translating Cape Cod in my native Bulgarian, which is quite a challenge. You wouldn't wonder why. But this is, of course, Thoreau's sunniest book, as everybody says, but it's sunniest because it's his funniest. So it's the fun. Thank you, Paul, so much. I enjoyed um, your smiling face and the joy you brought to this panel. Thank you. And we had this, you know, balance between the two other presentations and my sort of utopian um, uh, moderation in the end. Thank you. Hey, well, thank you all for being here. Um, we may have thank already you. cut off from, from our audience, but if, if not, um, everyone should remember that we can keep the conversation going through feed loop if we'd like. So once again, uh, thanks and- uh, Thank you too. Touch. Hey, yeah, thanks thank for you. Jeff. Thank all. Okay. Thank you. I take care.